the bell is frozen at a.m. Really? The yeah. bell is frozen? The uh, bell is frozen. <laughs> wow. We had a TV that was out that didn't work for two days. And uh, I phoned and they said, well, it'll be a week before you come. They can come out and fix it. And uh, and I was I had quite a conversation with her. So uh, and he said, well, everything in the receiver works just fine. Why don't you have a look at the dish? So I had a look at the dish and here's the snowball. Here's the dish. There's a there's the transmitter. It's a great big snowball. So we said, how do we get on the roots? And I thought I didn't get any permission from that. From that. See the big bell? Yes. Zoom, can you see the big bell? You can't see it? No, no. we can just hear it. It's okay if you don't have to. <laughs> At least you can hear it. I think it's a, big, it's a big band, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very big bell. People have to stand on either side of this big, huge, it looks like a ship. They're inside. Yeah. I thought it was Big Ben. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to share my screen with the what we have on here for the people at home. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. It takes quite a while to get that bell ringing. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, for trying to ring our frozen bell. Please uh, stand with me and uh, we will welcome the Holy Spirit together. This morning to be with us as we gather and we ask Lord for your divine exchange with us that we might hear from you that we might be able to share with you and to go away from here changed as a result amen you may be seated the 
the theme of this week's service is a new beginning. So we will have some scripture readings that refer to this theme and also a message that's focused on the big picture of new beginnings. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. Need a spell checker on that. I'll give you a moment to look this over and then we'll read it together. Let's read together. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This is Paul talking about what happens as the Holy Spirit comes into us and the new covenant. And we, as ministers of God's gospel and of God's grace, are competent because of what Christ through the Holy Spirit does in us and allows us to be able to minister to other people. And let's read this response together. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp, I will play to you. You can choose another instrument if you like. You don't have to use a ten-stringed harp. You can play a bell. Even if it's a cowbell, doesn't matter. God loves it when we make a joyful noise to him that celebrates who he is. I have uh, chosen a song that I'm going to play on YouTube, a video that we can sing along with, and it's entitled, Who You Say I Am. And part of the lyrics of the song, the message is that we are who God says that we are. We aren't who other people say we are, or our parents, or our siblings, or our neighbors, or our enemies. And we're not even sometimes who we say that we are, but we are actually who God says that we are. I'll just get it set up, and we'll sing together. The lyrics come on the screen as you need them. And it's a nice uh, display as well. Please stand with me. We're going to move into small groups. I have just a little brief statement here about new beginnings for you to think about and a question in the middle. Life itself provides a constant opportunity to grow. And to grow is to become new, to have a new beginning. How is God calling you to begin a new today? Think for a moment about those areas in your life where a new life is waiting to be born. Okay, I'll let you gather into small groups. I'll put the people in Zoom into a small group.
Because he put it up on stage, but it's harder for him to reach. That was a lot of effort. He might also be able to do that. He's sort of like, let that be for us. He just threw the voice at us. And then all of a sudden, then they broke the pants by the music. After a while, all of a sudden, I think it was a lot of ass in the house. And then there was a lot of ass in the house. Almost that much ass. It was probably 18 years ago when it happened. I remember doing the events. And there was a chance. Okay, I'm gonna pull you back in. Yeah, Rosemary's right on today. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to invite somebody from each group to come up and share with the rest of us what your prayer requests are. Uh, and uh, let's start with let's start with you, Wanda. Good morning, all. We have um, we wanted to comment on this. Uh, we wanted to pray for the fact that we have the blessing of being able to live in minus thirty degree weather, <laughs> because <laughs> when we think of others who are especially in the storm paths. We are very fortunate that we simply have a bit of cold weather every now and then. We also wanted to uh, think of, of Richie's sister and family and grandchildren in Florida. And, uh, but you commented, Richard, they're, yeah, they're very fortunate uh, regarding these storms. They have not been affected. And um, also prayers for, for the travelers, the Cavelands and the Jamesons are currently in Florida and we're keeping our fingers crossed. The storm is not going to affect where they are at Fort Myers. And we also, could we also pray for the family of a young man named Eric Hollisham. Eric sadly passed away on Wednesday night at Asia School. He was 13 years old, a grade eight student during basketball tryouts. So if we could pray for Eric's family. He has an older sister, an older brother and his parents. And extended family, I know he has some grandparents because they have, his hockey team had a special uh, game for him yesterday. And if we could uh, pray that Eric's soul rests in eternal peace, knowing how loved he is for his family. Um, we talked about new beginnings, and as Pete said, the Ukraine is having a new beginning now. And um, he said, you know, what? we have everything here that we need. We have heat, we have water, we have electricity. You know, our sewer systems work, we've got lots of food. Um, what have they got over there? You know, they, um, they apparently have heat 
and that's probably all we can really count on. So we do pray for the, the people in the Ukraine. And as Elaine was saying, the Industrial Revolution had a big, big change on the way we think about time. You know, it was before we got up when we when it was light, we went to bed when it was dark, and we worked when it was light. And um, she said, now we think we have more control of time, or do we have more control of time? You know, it's um, an interesting concept to think about, you know, so. Um, and other new beginnings too, you know, um, with COVID, we were very isolated and now we're having new beginnings where we can socialize with people. And that's, that's a big change for us, you know, and um, I, I'm finding it, I just like to socialize in little groups now, not in big groups. So um, we're, so we're beginning to get back to physically socializing again. Um, prayer requests for very dear friends of ours, and we prayed for them before for Nora and Fraser. Um, Nora has fallen three times in the last two days, and um, Fraser had to call 911 yesterday, and she's she's in the Foothills Hospital. She doesn't have a, a bed yet, but her, um, her electrolytes are down, and um, she hasn't been eating properly for probably two to three months now, and um, we just pray for them both. And Fraser has, he's got his own concerns too because he has prostate cancer. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's metastasized into his bones. So if we could just pray for them, that would be, be wonderful. Well, Fraser, Fraser is the type of person too. If you ask him, if you give a prayer request to him, I'm on it, he says, and he, you know him. He's got a very strong faith. And if there's somebody that wants to share with us from the Zoom group, just let me unmute the TV I thought I had already. Yeah, I think that'll work now. Okay, uh, we talked about new beginnings in that uh, advancing into old age as so many of us are in that church, in your church. And um, that's a new beginning. And for some of us, it's harder than others. Losing a spouse is the beginning of a new, a new time. And that can be a very difficult time. And uh, we ask for prayer for Joan because she, her sister-in-law, Pat, passed away this week. And the funeral service is tomorrow in Sedgwick. So we... Want, want to remember Joan as she travels to Sedgwick with her daughter and that things will go well and, and that they have a good trip down there and are safe. And we also pray for the family and for her, for brother who has lost his wife. And that will be a new beginning for him. We also want to pray for uh, Allison, that's Celine's uh, friend and partner and who's has been very sick and in the hospital. And if I haven't got all the details correct, uh, I think maybe um, you can interject here <laughs> and say something. Um, yeah, we kind of ran out of time. Just want to say that she had her consult and the, and the oncologist said, with no treatment, she probably will not live out the year. Uh, with treatment, checkpoint inhibitor, therapy it's no longer trial it's a regular treatment now and her chances of living past the year are at 58 percent with this it's um treatment and then one week and then three weeks off and then treatment again and it boosts her immune system and unfortunately a day later she had a problem pain in her leg and turns out she has a tumor on her femur that mm -hmm. is metastasized melanoma and they're concerned that might shatter the femur and the pain might be from that there was a little bit of a problem in the on-call oncologist not prescribing pain medicine so they were overnight in emergency for 16 hours until they finally saw a doctor 
who had an x-ray and said, no, there's no shattering of the femur and provided uh, a stronger pain med. So she has this complication. It may stop the therapy. They may stop the therapy to radiate, do radiation on the tumor on her femur. I don't know what the suggestion will be, but she really doesn't have time in terms of life expectancy to stop the therapy. So uh, things look quite serious and have been quite painful. So let's pray for Celine and Allison. We hope to see them on Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for sharing that and mom for um, representing your group on Zoom. Those uh, challenges that some of us face make life very sobering and really difficult to hear about a, a 13 year old dying of school and uh, somebody who's facing a very, very short life expectancy. And this is the juxtaposition that we find ourselves living in in this world. And we live between life and death. And the only thing that is constant that we can really rely on is, is God and his constant reaching out to us and what we receive as a result of what Christ has done. And we get those new beginnings because of Christ. So let's pray and let's ask for new beginnings for these families who are going into very difficult situations. And for us, as we face our own challenges, each one of us, and nobody else's challenge trumps our own. We all have challenges that we face, and Christ is with us, each one, regardless of what our challenges. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the break in the weather, the chance for us maybe to fix some things that are breaking because of the cold to think ahead to what our winter season might look like and the challenge it might be for some people. For those who have had natural disasters that are close or uh, acts of violence that are not too far away, whether that be in places like in Florida or in Turkey or in Ukraine. Our life is uncertain. We pray, Lord, for the family of Eric Holsham, the devastation of losing a 13-year-old child so unexpectedly. We ask for your comfort for his siblings and for his parents, and for the children in the school, as they are full of questions. But why? Why now? Why here? Why him? Many of them are questions that we can't answer. But we ask for your comfort to come and surround those people. We think of Fraser and Nora. We think of Allison. We think of David as he's putting to rest his wife of decades tomorrow. And the challenges people are walking into with the disruption that they faced a complete life disruption. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would come alongside them. That we would receive comfort from you, that we would receive strength from you. That we would know that you are around us and near us and by us. That we can hold on to your staff and that we can be led by your spirit even when the road ahead of us looks formidable, unsurmountable, impassable. Help us today, Lord, receive some comfort and insight from your word. What we understand is the history of experience that you have with your people and all those who have reached out to you. Help us to understand better how you relate to us and how we can live in this world in a way that honors you and receives from you and 
we pray that we would be making a difference in this world, that it would be a better place because of what your spirit is doing in and through us. Give us grace for this day, for this week ahead, and for the weeks ahead for those who are in such difficult circumstances. May they have your strength. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> Thanks for your patience. Please stand with me. Note that our mission statement is so well aligned with the song that we sang, or the song that we sang is so well aligned with our mission statement that we are children of God. Let's read it together. I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. Therefore, Therefore I am somebody. The power of Christ, the power of Christ is within, within me. I hope that you can read this. It's a little bit longer, but I think that as we read, you will appreciate why I have chosen this. Let's read together. Father, we live in a world that is tainted by sin and a world that is becoming more and more evil. But I thank you that I have been made a new creation in Christ and have begun a new life in him. I thank you that despite the difficulties I face in this God, I thank you that despite the difficulties that my inner man in is being day by day my inner by the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. I praise and thank you that although this mortal body is perishing and will one day die, and will one day die. I have been Christ, I have life, given me and been able life, to overcome and been able to overcome the sufficient strength. Keep me from being conformed to this world and help me to live in the midst of life until my life's end. I pray that I may be transformed by my mind's renewal and following God's will and all I say and do. You may be seated. Elaine, do you want to invite Toby to come in now? So, Toby and I have had great experiences since the last time both of us were in church. Since the last time Toby was here and since the last time I was here, we both had birthdays. And I don't have my $58 coins. And Toby doesn't have his $5. But come up to the front, Toby. It's right under the corner of the church. I've got a token. It's here. On the table, do you see the little church? And by the corner, you can see that little bill. Can you take that and put it in the church? There's a little token of our birthday money. And we're going to put an e-transfer and send it to the church. You can stick it in the slot now. You see this? Again, you're going to have to hold it again and stick it in there. His name is Toby. Toby. It's first little guy. The son. Yeah. So I think when Ken Freeze, thank you very much, Toby. When Ken Freeze had his last birth last birthday, he reminded us of what a tradition was here in Dale Mead, that people would put the number of dollars in the church for their birthday. So this is just a way of us acknowledging our thanks to God uh, for Dale Mead and for getting through another year and looking forward to a new year ahead for our birthdays. Thanks so much, Toby. Wanda? So can we please sing happy birthday? Sure. Do you want to stand with Wanda? Do you want me to help me start? Do you want me to help you start off? Or... <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear. Toby and Happy birthday to us. <laughs> Thank 
I am reading the story today uh, out of the book of Sir Samuel. I've elected to read it again myself because of the number of details right at the very beginning, unusual names. Um, can somebody at home just give me a, a nod or a wave that everything is good? Because I, I don't actually, somebody might have to say something because I'm not seeing anybody's faces. Can you see the screen properly? Oh, I think you've got the wrong screen. It's probably one of the problems. Do you see the blue screen now? Yes. At home on Zoom? Anybody? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So this scripture is about the beginnings of Samuel coming into Israel's history. And Samuel was a very, very important figure because he was the prophet that then anointed the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. So this is how Samuel's life began. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Ziphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Story yet. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli, the priest, remember, thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring my soul out to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. 
Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. This is also not the end of the story, but it's where we're stopping. So I just want to spend a few minutes and talk to you about the idea of new beginnings and what this means for us as we reflect on the story of Samuel and this narrative in scripture. Right at the very beginning of the story, there's a lot of details, all of those names, so-and-so who was the son of so-and-so and from this place and from that place, and there's a lot going on. I don't think you remember those names or places, do you? No. There's no test. This isn't quiz time, no trivia that you need to know. But those details tell me two things. First thing that it tells me is it's more likely that this story actually is true. When I'm working in the business that I do, one of the things that we ask about when people talk about a conflict Instead of them just saying, oh yeah, uh, we had a fight and uh, it was bad, it was really bad. I don't just stop there. I'll probe for some details. And the reason why we probe for details in this kind of situation, or even when police are doing their investigation, is because they want to determine how true or how likely is it that this story is true. Because the more details that there are, the more likelihood it is that the story is actually accurate. And that's what I think the reason is many of these details are there. Because Eli, Elkanah, Hannah, Panina, Samuel, they were all real people. They lived. And part of the history of who Eli and Elkanah were is in scripture to assure us that this isn't just a fairy tale that starts off with once upon a time. But it took place at a specific place at a specific time with specific people. And it's important for that for us because when we know that this is true, that it really happened to somebody, it helps us better understand how God actually relates with us and what it means for us then. Because if God does this for Hannah and we have Samuel, what are the implications for me? What does it mean when we get to the end of the story and we get to the point that says that God heard Anna, that the Lord remembered her? God knew what her situation was. God knows the situation of Fraser and Nora. God knows the situation of Eric's family. God knows what's happening with Allison. God knows all of those things that are troubling us and are difficult for us. And he wants to be a part of that. He's aware and he's concerned with our lives and not just the lives of the people that are in scripture. Elkanah had two wives. This is a little strange for us because we live in a culture in a time where it's not appropriate. It's not legal in Canada to have two wives, but his culture and his time and his place, it was appropriate. It was okay. There wasn't anything culturally wrong with it. Scripture doesn't actually say, except when it talks about elders in the church, about how many wives you should have. And so I'm not advocating polygamy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Don't anybody put that on your blog this week. Yeah, our pastor said it's okay to marry two wives. <laughs> because our times are also controlled by our culture. But for, for Elkanah, his two wives actually created some tension in his family. Now, you don't have to have more than one wife to have tension in your family. <laughs> uh, but 
What happened here, as you can see in the narrative, it was very clearly written that Penina felt that somehow she was a better person because she had children and Hannah didn't. And their interpretation at that time was that God blesses women with children. And if you don't have children as a woman, then somehow you must be cursed or that God is not in favor of you. And this is how they interpret it. And so Penina thinks she's got the upper hand and she irritated Hannah to provoke her. The motivation was there. It's so sad how that happened in that family relationship. And Elkanah is trying somehow to resolve this. Maybe he didn't have very good communication skills. Family systems worked very differently back then. Um, one of them has children, the other doesn't. And Hannah is very, very distraught about this. Interpersonal relationships impact our lives today, just like they did in Elkanah's time and Penina and Hannah's time. They're having troubles in their family. Interactions that we have with others can significantly impact our relationships. It can impact our sense of God and also of his work in our lives. And it can also impact what we sense our own value is in God's eyes. Can you imagine that infighting that's going on between Penina and Hannah? How does that Hannah make Hannah feel about what God thinks about her, about whether or not she is valued as a person, about whether or not God cares about her? And so this really negative interpersonal interaction is, I'm sure, extremely demoralizing for Hannah. And she is so discouraged about this. She desperately wants to have a child. And so she goes, she makes the choice to go and make a vow at the temple. But this idea here, I just found this little post-it note and I thought, well, this is great because the impact that we can have on other people can change their day. Our days are impacted by the interactions that we have around us. You go into a store, you have a ne negative interaction, something goes really wrong, you come back out to your car and you're just like, oh, I'm so upset about that. They, you know, they did something wrong to me or they treated me unfairly or, you know, whatever they had broke and I can't get it replaced, but they won't fix it, they won't honor their guarantee and it ruins your day. You can also go into a store as you're going through the checkout, somebody who's checking your groceries for you, and you say, hey, how are you? How's your day going? I just wanted to send a good wish your way. I just wanted to tell you, thank you so much for the good work that you're doing and for making me feel welcome here. And that little positive interaction from you to that other person can change their day. And we can switch the narrative from what's happening between Penina and Hannah from being a negative interaction to being a positive one just by making the decision I'm going to have a positive impact on this person. And what does it cost you to smile or make a compliment to somebody else? But it will make their day better. And it will make a ripple effect and then create a better community that we live in. But we can choose whether we want to be like Panina and provoke other people. Or we can choose that I actually want to be a positive force, and we can create these new beginnings in people's lives simply by simple words that we say. I put the word vows into my computer browser to see if I could find a nice picture to put up here for the Nazarite vow that Hannah made. And of course, it's pages and pages and pages and pages of pictures of wedding vows, because in our society, all people think about when they think about vows is the vow that you make when you get married. I couldn't find a picture of a Nazarite vow. What's a Nazarite vow anyways? What is this thing that Hannah did? So back in Hannah's day, if they wanted to separate something or someone, they would make a Nazarite vow. Nazarite, the word Nazir, 
has two meanings to it. One is to be separate, but it's also related to the word for crown, the crown like on a king's hat. And it's related. That's an interesting point to know because it helps us to understand what this means. In Numbers chapter 6, which I'm not going to read to you, it describes what's involved in the Nazarite vow. And there's three things. One, that they won't eat or drink, except a very, very small amount, any fruit of the vine. Now, if you noticed in scripture, Hannah said to the priest who thought that he was drunk, I haven't been drinking wine or beer. I had beer before that. It's good to know, right? It was frequent. People drank fermented drinks that had alcohol in them. That was a normal practice, and people got drunk. They did that. The priest thought she was drunk at church, right? She went to the temple. They're doing this ritual, uh, annual sacrifices, and he thinks that maybe she's drunk. And she's like, no, 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 no. I'm not drunk. I was praying. My lips were moving. You just didn't hear any sound coming out. I was actually doing something sacred by not being drunk in the temple. And the Nazarite vow says, you're not going to eat or drink any of the vine. No razor will go on the person's head. So they won't cut their hair. And that's where crown also comes in because your hair is actually seen as the crown of who you are how some people interpret it. And you will not have any contact with the dead. So if somebody happens to die in your presence, then you become dirty. There's uncleanness associated in Hebrew tradition with, with dead people. And so if you've been in contact with somebody who's dead, you have to be ritually purified in order to be involved in sacrifice. So for a Nazarite, if they make these vows, basically they are saying, I'm going to keep myself set apart. I'm going to keep myself pure. And Hannah was making this vow saying, if you give me a son, he will be a Nazarite all of his life. Normally, people would make a Nazarite vow for 30 days. That's pretty extreme to say all of his life he's going to be a Nazarite. He's never going to cut his hair. He's never going to drink any, any alcohol, you know, any fermented drink. Um, and he is going to be completely separate, separate from the rest of, you know, whatever could make him impure. If you give me this son, I will dedicate him to you. That's what Hannah was saying. I'm desperate, God, for a child. I'm so desperate that if you give the child to me, I will give the child completely back to you. And God heard her cry. And God answered her. I'm ending this with the last point, the choices of God. Because there are so many things in life that we can do. And there are many things in life that we have no control over. Those biggest things we can't control. How many days we're going to live? Who is going to be born to whom? natural disasters. We don't control those things. We can't control the weather. I'd love it to be 12 degrees outside, green grass, and we'd go have our lunch outside on tables and chairs today, but that's not my choice to make. God makes these choices. And this is what happened with Hannah. God had this choice, and I don't know the reasons why, but her womb was closed. She was being provoked by this woman who presumably they lived in the same house. I can't imagine what that must have been like. But Hannah cries out to God. And God then makes the choice. He listens to her. And he answers her. And he opens her womb. And Samuel is the new beginning of what's coming ahead for the people of God, the people of Israel. This man is going to grow up to be a prophet, and he is going to have significant impact in his role on traditional society, on those people, those people of God. Things are going to change with this monarchy. The Israelites desperately wanted a monarchy. They weren't living in the time of the judges the way God wanted them to. And Samuel is 
God's relenting for Israel's request for a king, the beginnings of it, as Hannah, a woman whose womb was closed and now it's been opened up. We can also look back and see other times when God made unusual choices. Hagar and Sarah. Sarah didn't have any children and God promised Abraham he was going to have a son and then Sarah miraculously gave birth. And then later on, Jacob and Esau, those two twins. Esau was the older one. The birthright was really his, but actually God's choice was the second born. Jacob. And as we look through history, we don't know why God makes particular choices that he does, why he listens and responds at some times, and at other times it seems like he's not. And our life sometimes is held in this place of, why is this happening to me? Why am I facing this challenge? Why am I struggling with this issue? God makes those choices. We're not in the place to make them. Job struggled with that very, very much with God. If that's something that you're struggling with, go and read the book of Job. It's a tough slog. He's got an argument that goes on with his friends, a conversation that they have, where they're accusing him like Penina was accusing Hannah. Obviously, you're not good enough, otherwise you'd have children. And that's not the message God wants us to have. We are children of God. We are somebody. And we are who God says that we are. Those are the things that we need to hang on to when we have those questions. Why me? Why now? Why this place? Hannah waited a long time. God listened to her and he remembered her. God knows the details of Hannah's background and her husband's history. And he knows the details of your life. And let me tell you, he is very, very interested in your life and all of those details. He has not forgotten you. He hears you. And he responds. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this recording of Alcana and Hannah and Penina and what we can learn from it. And thank you for Samuel, the answer. God answered me. This is what Hannah names her son. Samuel, God answered me. Help us to remember that you answer. Help us to believe that you answer. And for us to cry out when we are in our distress and in our pain. And to know that you are a God who cares and listens. Amen. This week, may you remember that you are who God says you are. That you are a child of his. And that renewal is ours because of what Christ and the Holy Spirit have done for us. Go in peace to love and serve God and your community. Amen. Would you like to do announcements, Wanda? <clears throat> do you, go ahead if you don't mind mentioning Christmas Eve, of course. Yes. Yeah. We're going to have a Christmas Eve service. Uh, have we, did we decide at the time? Yes. Four o'clock for the bonfire, and we'll have hot chocolate and soup, and then 5.30 for the service. And, and of course, the um, pops are generous in providing the, uh, the wagon or sleigh ride, depending on the weather. So please mention it to all your friends and family to come join, uh, whatever their age. Um, my family at home have already started talking about Christmas Eve service. So uh, make sure that you come early enough with your coats so you can put them on the, you need them outside. So somehow we're going to have to find a way, uh, make sure that your family comes so that they can find a seat. And uh, we're really looking forward to that time together. Um, did you want to talk more about Operation Christmas Child? 
Um, just the fact that we actually have a found the volunteers we needed. We put in for a dozen, and we now have a dozen. So um, a handful of us are going to be going to take care of Operation Christmas Child. But I think also, you, I think, would you like us to bring some boxes here? If, if you want to pr provide the shoe boxes? Or... I think bringing boxes... Well, I, um, sometimes this, some may want to do that, or even just having the boxes brought here just so they can pick them up here and go home and fill them. So, so the, the volunteers are going to the warehouse to fill boxes there. But other the other part of the program is that they can provide boxes to people who are interested. They can take them home, they can fill the box, and they can bring it back. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll um, bring the boxes out here just to get them. And maybe you want to take them home. That would be no great. Oh, take home if yeah, maybe what you could do is before you bring them here, if we have a list of what we can put in those boxes, people could actually purchase those things and bring them to the church the day that you bring the boxes, and we can stuff them here and send them back with you. Or that's great. Okay, I hope everybody on Zoom got that. We can pop some details into your newsletter. That's terrific. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you very much. Please join us for coffee and fellowship and may God bless you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. God bless you guys this week and good to be with you in the Zoom room. Yes, well, thank you. Kathleen and same to you. Okay. Please sister Celine of and Allison of our prayers for them here from the I church. Will. <laughs> sure, uh, I will make sure. And Joan for David as you go tomorrow to be with family. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you all. Bye.